Well, peoples, you know, crowd in here. <laughs> this is an intimate session. Uh, thanks for coming to the Oak Conference, the first in many years, of course, and um, nice to actually see people again and <laughs> not have coverings on our faces and all that. Uh, so, my name is Joel Dufour. I am the owner of Earth Tools in Owenton, Kentucky. Um, we're a small business dedicated to um, supporting small farmers, basically, with uh, appropriate, appropriately sized equipment for micro farming. Um, what we're going to talk about today is walk behind tractors. Hey, look, even the big button works. So everything we do is about, yes, come in, come in. We haven't really started yet. I'm just rambling up here, filling up time. This thing recording okay? Okay. He says we've shut you off because you're too boring. <laughs> so what we're going to be talking about today are these walk-behind uh, tractor pieces of equipment that... Uh, Nobody, well, very few people in the North American market tend to understand, which is why we're giving workshops on them. I wouldn't have to give a workshop on what a four-wheel tractor is, because pretty much everybody knows. But yeah, everything we do at Earth Tools is dedicated to farming with your feet on the earth. We made that our little byline several years ago. There's a lot of farming done with your, when your feet don't touch the ground, and we think that's problematic. Uh, so what the heck is a walk behind tractor? Now, I, I typically don't read what's on the screen because you guys, I don't want to insult your intelligence. You, you can read this. Um, so what is, a full, what is a full size tractor? It's something that by itself does absolutely nothing. You buy a tractor and it's useless. You can drive around the field all day and it does nothing. You have to have an implement attached to it for the implement to do the work, a plow, a tiller, a mower, a post hole digger, a front loader, something. A two-wheel tractor is exactly the same thing. It is a power source for implements um, with two wheels and handlebars instead of four wheels and a seat and a steering wheel. It's just scaled down. But the idea is exactly the same. It's just for a smaller scale of farming. Um, there are some things on the U.S. market that sort of pose as walk-behind tractors, but aren't really because they, they're not, they don't have a full array of implements available for them. I mean, the, the walk-behind tractor is really um, kind of defined by its versatility. Yes, the typical lawn and garden equipment, that's what we've grown accustomed to here in the North American market. So if we want to till a garden or mow a lawn, we go and we buy a tiller or a lawnmower, or we buy a snowblower, or we buy a, an edger. And they're all different machines with different engines on them, and they're all made to last just a few days longer than the warranty, and then they self-destruct into little bitty bits, and you haul it off to the recycling if you're lucky and get two cents for it. Well, no, you get four cents now because metal's up. But, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, it, it's just kind of mind-boggling, the, the waste of materials that goes into this kind of thinking because you have a different piece of equipment constructed for every use, and they're all made with a, a very short lifespan in mind, uh, kind of planned obsolescence. In fact, you know, usually after seven years, you can't even get parts for them. Um, and the Europeans have stuck with a... You know, the, the Europeans have their share of lawn and garden equipment that's junk as well, but they've, they've really popularized over the years these walk-behind tractors, which are built well enough to last you know, several generations, actually. And you've probably all read that by now while I've been jabbering. So, European walk-behind tractors, uh, American-made single-purpose lawn and garden equipment. I'm not going to mention brand names, but you, know, you probably know what those things are. Um, you know, one thing that characterizes at least modern walk-behind tractors and really sets them apart is just the drivetrain system. You notice these drivetrains, like the engine powertrain goes straight through this machine. Same with this. This is an all-gear drive machine. These are, this is a 
powertrain going downward here and then being shifted here to the front, that's a belt. This has a powertrain that comes through, goes down to the transmission, that's a belt right there. Belts obviously are cheap and easily produced and good thing because you need to replace them a lot. And they slip and, you know, are a headache. And they're also a great power loss. I mean, a belt loses about 20% of your power because it's transferring the power through friction. There are no teeth on a belt. It's a V-shaped belt wedged into a pulley, coming off that pulley and going onto another pulley, and it's delivering that power through friction. Friction means heat. Heat means energy loss. This is back to high school physics. So, so one of the uh, really ironic things about walk-behind tractors is that the first PTO drive walk-behind tractors, and everybody know what a PTO is? Power takeoff. So it's the, where you take the power off the tractor. If you had a big tractor, it would be the shaft that comes out the back. Um, so the first PTO drive walk-behind tractor in the world was built in West Virginia. It was by the Gravely Company. Uh, you may have all heard of the name Gravely. It's kind of an old American staple. Now, we went out of business. It was purchased by, Gra uh, by Aaron's. Aaron's owns the brand now. Um, but this was American ingenuity. At its finest, in 1919, he cobbled one of these things together on his workbench. By 1926, uh, Mr. Gravely had a little factory going and was producing these machines uh, in the mountains of West Virginia, where small-scale, you know, multitask equipment was very practical because of the steep slopes and small land areas they were dealing with. Um, and, you know, the Gravely phenomenon... Affected. I mean, there were a lot of takeoffs and spinoffs and things. I mean, we had uh, Chore Master, we had uh, David Bradley, we had Montgomery Wards used to make an old walking tractor, so did Sears and Roebuck, although I think theirs was probably a rebadge, David Bradley. Um, we had Aaron's used to make an old walk-behind tractor, Planet Junior. There was a bunch of American brands in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s that produced walk-behind tractors in America. Uh, many of them were cruder machines. The Gravely... Gravely really was the only one with an actual PTO where it could hook up different implements and run those implements by a rotary shaft. Most of the other machines were just a, a, a hunk of metal <laughs> that dragged things. It was basically a transmission with an engine and a set of handlebars, and you would either push or pull things with it. And most of them had like a belt drive sickle bar you could run off there for mowing hay, but they were cruder machines. But the Gravely was way ahead of its time. The Europeans started getting into walk-behind tractors really in a big way after World War II. And um, there, was a, there was an advertisement somebody showed me from Italy one time, which was interesting. I didn't understand it because I didn't read the language and still don't, which is terrible since I sell Italian equipment. Bam, bam. But uh, this advertisement had a picture of a, of a person plowing with an ox, right? You know, the ox pulling the plow through. And then a picture below that of a walk-behind tractor pulling a plow. And you would look at this as a modern person and think, oh, they're saying, this ad is saying, oh, this is the new style, out with the old. But what it was actually saying was the new is just as good as the old because the Europeans are such traditionalists. And this was the traditional way you did it for a zillion years. You plowed your field with an ox or a mule or whatever it was. And tradition carries a tremendous amount of weight over there. So they were saying, this is just as good. Not better. You wouldn't dare say that the new stuff was better. But this is just as good. And you don't have to feed the mule at the end of it, right? You put it in your barn and it, it doesn't eat while it's resting. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, but, but there, was a, there was a big difference in the, you know, the, whole, uh, the whole way that small farms were treated after World War II in Europe versus North America. In North America, the USDA came out and said, you know, get bigger, get out. And they, you know, said, no, cities shouldn't actually be surrounded by farmland that feeds the cities. That's stupid. We can grow that in California. And gas is cheap, so we'll just truck it over here. So we're going to just destroy all that nice farmland and put suburbs there because they are where the money is. Now look at them. So, of course, that was a pendulum swing in one direction. Now we're having a pendulum swing in the other direction because people are finding out what that was all about and the problems with it. Uh, so local farms are through the roof again. Um, but in Europe, see, tradition, tradition, tradition. 
your tomatoes have to be fresh and they have to be grown right there. And that farm grows the best whatever, you know, onions. So they wanted to keep their small farms alive. I mean, tradition was, was very important in many European countries. So keeping the farms the same size was just a given. But modernizing the equipment made them more efficient. So the walk behind tractors slowly replaced the hoof stock, basically. Um, and since the you know, reliance on small farms has stayed at a pretty, pretty flat line uh, throughout the last 70 years, walk behind tractors are still popular today in Europe. There's an old Gravely, 1945. That's at the New York State Fair. Um, that's an old BCS. That's the first BCS machine ever produced. Their first machines were just hay mowing machines. They actually weren't uh, full-on walk-behind tractors. Uh, they did walk-behind hay mowing equipment. It was walk-behind tractors. There's an old simplicity. I missed talking about that earlier. Chore master, that's a one-wheel job. That was really made for the mountains because... It was just like a wheelbarrow on a hillside. You could straighten it up. Yeah. I mean, the motor ran straight. You just ran the contour with the thing. My dad traded for one of those once. That was a mistake. Um, I mean, we never could get it running. The old CMAR um, in the 1930s, this is what the Troy built was modeled after. The guy who founded Troy built modeled it after that thing, although he cheapened it up tremendously because this was an all-gear drive machine. That was a hell of a machine right there. He said, oh, we can do that better with valves because we're mass-producing them. And besides, we're just gardening in the suburbs. So what can walk behind tractors do? There's a, there's a list, and it's not even complete anymore because this slide shows three or four years old, so we've added a few implements. Uh, but there's... What we don't have on here is a front loader. You know, it's hard to run a front loader on something when you've only got one axle. You pick up something on that end and you go up in the air. <laughs> it's a fulcrum. <laughs> so that doesn't work too well. And we don't have a post hole digger yet, but we are working on one. We actually have a working pr prototype for a post hole digger. Um, so we've almost got it all. And we keep adding every year. We add one or two more implements. I'll stop here and say, any questions? Any, when are you coming out with a, fill in the blank, blender? Well, that's a chipper shredder. All right, on to the next one. So, one of the things that sets a real walk-behind tractor apart from kind of the fake ones uh, is the ability to rotate the handlebars around so that your implement can be on either end of the machine. But if you're running a soil working implement like what's on this thing right now, this is a power harrow on this thing, you obviously want the implement in the back because the tires are making tracks and the implement is erasing the tracks. Uh, and you don't even have to leave tracks because you can offset your handles to the side and walk over here and drink your, oh, no drink holder. Darn, okay, that, that, we need to come up with that. Um, but if you're mowing, of course, having a mower right here at your feet would be detrimental. So, um, and in fact, full-size tractors, at least full-size tractors in the North American market, just don't seem to get it. All the mowers go on the back. And if you're doing trim mowing with a bush hog or a finish mower, you are soon visiting the chiropractor because your head is like this all the time from looking behind you because when you swing the mower in and out, you don't want to hit things. Uh, also, you're driving the wheels over the material you're about to mow. So it pushes it down and you don't get a clean cut. So this is... Interestingly, the European four-wheel tractors usually have front and rear PTOs. Silence that thing. That took a college degree right there. So now I would put the mower on the front, and I would have the mower in the front where it belongs. My snow removal equipment, like a snow blower or snow blade, would go in the front. Uh, the hay rakes and hay balers for these machines actually go in the front because there's not room for it behind. Um, that's the, 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 probably the bigger, yeah, I'd say the bigger percent of in, uh, implements go in the front rather than the rear. There's one outfitted with steel tracks. We don't sell many of those. They're pretty extreme. One with headlights, which, you know, 
that's a little extreme too. I'm not going to work that late. Uh, this is a swamp, actually. Uh, they're mowing reeds, which they're later bailing up in another slide. There's a rotary plow. That was that picture was supplied by a customer up in Ohio. Ohio. Yeah. Um, See, that's taking, there's, yeah, there's the baler baling reeds up in the swamp. Let's see, spray rig. We actually just refer people to a, there's a custom spray rig place in Pennsylvania run by Mennonites. We just refer our customers to them when they want a spray rig because they'll customize it wherever you want. I mean, just to, uh, to give you an idea of how popular walk behind tractors are in Europe, um, Italy produces more walk-behind tractors than any other country in Europe. Uh, Italy is roughly the size of Arizona in total land base. They have about 15 brands of walk-behind tractors coming out of a, you know, a state or country that size. Now, other European countries have them too. The French make one, the Swiss make a couple, the Germans make one, uh, the Spanish make one, I think the Russians make a couple. Um, but yeah, Italy is like the mecca of walk-behind tractors. The only one who comes, who surpasses them in walk-behind tractor production are the, um, the, the Chinese, and we'll have a little chapter on those later. So yeah, if you're a micro farm, if you're farming you know, just a few acres, there's no point in investing $30,000 in farming equipment when you're, you, know, you have trouble turning it around in your garden plot, um, hence less space needed for maneuvering. I mean, this thing will turn around in six feet. I mean, there's much space. Steep slopes? Yeah, they're great on those. I have, I mow like 30, 35 degree slopes all the time with these things. If it rolls, I just pick it up at the bottom of the hill and go on. Uh, the fuel efficiency is, is really very good because, as we say, you're not moving all this extra steel around the field. It's kind of an implement being driven by an engine. The transmission really doesn't weigh much. And a lot of the maintenance on these things, you know, they're a simple enough machine by and large that most people can do the maintenance themselves, uh, especially with our uh, self-help tutorials on our website and so forth. So forth. There's some just economic uh, examples. These prices were pre-COVID. <laughs> so add 10%. Maybe 20% on some of these. Man, I need to update these. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think you could get away from under 30 with that right now. And that would be probably closer to 10. Yeah, boy. i got to update that. It's been a while since we had trade shows <laughs> and conferences. So I haven't shown this slide in a while. Yeah, but roughly, you know, it's about a third the cost of what you invest in, in four-wheel equipment. So we've covered the maneuvering thing. And this is, this is a big one right here. I mean, you can get your far, if you're, if you're in the market gardening or, you know, berry production or orchards or whatever it is, well, maybe not orchards, but when you don't need space for a big piece of equipment to get through, you can compress things a lot. So you can get a lot, you can get twice the food on an acre when the equipment is based on walk behind farming equipment rather than full size farming equipment. And, you know, to some people, that's not a big deal because they have plenty of land. But a lot of farmers are working on small pieces of land because land is damn expensive these days. And you're going to want to maximize it. Questions? I have another question about the, is it a hydraulic, do they have a, does it have a hydraulic wheel drive or is it a huge drive? This this particular tractor right here has a hydro component. Um, does, it, does this one say hydro? Yeah, it says the high on it. It's just saying high. Um, yeah, this is the first walk behind tractor introduced in the U.S. market that actually has a hydraulic component in the transmission. So it has gears driving the hydro pump. The hydro pump then drives the gears that drive the wheels. So it's like the hydro, it's a hydro over gear system. Uh, the hydro just gives you infinite speed variability and the ability to shuttle back and forth between forward and reverse without using a clutch. That's nice, especially for mowing applications. 
Um, but for years, traditionally, they've been all gear drive, just auto, you know, engine, automotive type clutch, gearbox, um, and you know, multiple speeds, forward and reverse. And that's, that's been the standard, and that's still my favorite design. I mean, this Hydra thing came out a couple of years ago. We sold a few of them. They're nice, um, but, you know, they're unproven as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I know from just experiencing other styles of equipment, a hydro drive is not as reliable as a gear drive. You know, you're going to have failures eventually because you've got that hydraulic component. And it's not as power efficient either. I mean, hydraulic drive, I talked about how belts lose power. You know, 20, 15 to 20 percent of your power loss through belts. Hydro loses at least 30 percent through heat. I mean, you're you're moving the thing through fluid, right? It's hydraulic fluid being pumped, and that generates heat. There's actually a cooling coil on the side of the transmission there. So, um, you know, for strenuous activities, you know, the hydro drive, for example, pulling a plow or pushing a dozer blade, the hydro would not be your choice because you're asking a lot of the wheels at that point. So the gear drive would be much more efficient. So, uh, you know, to me, the, the, the jury's still out on whether the Hydro is worth fooling with. It raises the price of the tractor like $1,500. And, you know, if you're doing a lot of mowing, it might be worth it. So, yes? How does it do on hills? I've, I've, I've got a, yeah, I mean, that's a pretty good. That's 45 degree slope. It's gravely, it's it's terrible on hills. So, it's belt driven, and that's, I didn't really know why. You have a gravely that's belt driven? It's, uh, it's not a true Gravely. It's one of those Aaron Gravelys. Aaron, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they bought the brand, and now they think they, you know, we're Gravely. No, we're not. Yeah, you're going to try that with us, Gravely? No. <laughs> no, the true old Gravelys would handle slopes like that, like the real gear drive ones made in West Virginia. But, uh, yeah, this, this guy has cleated combat boots on, okay? You don't stand on a slope like that without them. And I've been in the Italian Alps watching people mow on these kinds of slopes. It's freaking scary. I mean, the guy's wearing cleats, and you only turn the tractor going uphill. You make your turns uphill, because if you turn going downhill, it's hard to get on the slope. <laughs> yeah, it's quite, a, it's quite a little chore. But, you know, in the Alps, um, or any of those mountainous countries, because the, the Alps, well... The Alps run through many countries, of course. But, you know, the Europeans m use such a greater percentage of their land than we do. They don't have a concept of wasteland, uh, land that doesn't get used. I've seen them mowing the roadsides for hay. I mean, it's, it's hay. Now, it's probably high in heavy metals because of all the car exhaust, but they're using it anyway. Um, but, uh, yeah, they just, they just don't let things go to waste. I mean, for years, it was hard to get the Europeans to produce a brush mower for the walk-behind tractors. You know, that seems just basic to us. Well, we just need to mow this waste area over here. It's, it's just overgrown. We need a brush mower. They're like, brush? What's brush? You know, we have farms, and we have houses, and we have woods, and there's nothing else. You know, it was brush. So finally, after 20 years, they built brush mowers. Their first one was a disaster. It was just a glorified lawnmower. So we got them to redesign it. And even lawns. Like when we started selling walk around tractors in the 1970s, when my dad became a dealer in 77, they didn't offer a lawnmower. They didn't have it. It was like, what's a lawn? That's where you grow vineyards and, you know, food and things. So, but then they, they went to England and they said, yeah, they have lawns. So I guess the Americans do too. They speak English. So they came out with lawnmowers eventually. But yeah, sickle bars were the only kind of mowers they produced for many years because it's practical. You're producing animal forage. This is, this is food. So the Far East, I mentioned that earlier. The Chinese and the Taiwanese and the Koreans uh, and the Indians even produce a lot of walk-behind tractors. A lot of them are, you know, used in rice fields and things like this. And a lot of them are super crude machines. I mean, these are, you know, just kind of like that old, old style American walk behind tractor I was talking about, like the Planet Juniors and the, and the uh, David Bradleys, where it was just an engine driving a transmission which drove wheels and it just dragged things. Now, in this case, they have a great big belt that drives this rototiller in the back. That's real safe. OSHA would have a cow. <laughs> There's no guards or anything. Um, and some of these engines are so crude that they're, they're air-cooled engines. Well, they're water-cooled. They're water-cooled engines, and there's just a pan on top of the engine, like an open pan. And that's the cylinder head. 
And to cool it, you scoop up water out of your rice paddy and dump it on the top. And when it all evaporates, you put some more in because otherwise it'll overheat. <laughs> it comes a little cup. You dump it up there. So um, they produce a mess of these things. And there's a kind of, unfortunately, the sort of quality that you would expect out of China. Uh, not too great. I mean, they're cheap. They're cheap as anything. Um, and people will often call me and say, I, I'm looking on Alibaba website. I can get a walking tractor for $1,200, and it's 18 horsepower and has a 33-inch tiller on the back. Well, why is your stuff so expensive? I'm like, because you'll still have it in 30 years, and it won't be a lawn ornament. Um, I, I was actually talking to a guy from the United Nations, or he worked with the United Nations program to... Um, with a program to sort of modernize some of the third world countries in terms of their agriculture, and they had this program to buy walk behind tractors to go down there and sort of, you know, replace some of the hoof stock and make farms more efficient and things like this. And they put out bids, and we bid on it. Uh, so, um, well, this, this is two separate things. A bid came through. We bid on 300 walking tractors. Of course, we didn't get the bid because they ended up buying Chinese equipment because it was a quarter of the price. So then about a year later, I was talking to somebody at a trade show, and he worked in this program. And he's like, oh, yeah, that was a disaster because we got all these machines down there. The gearboxes all went out in the first year. They just fell apart. So they all took the engines off of them and stuck them on washing machines or generators or whatever, and the rest of the things are rusting away in the field, and they never want to look at a walk-behind tractor again because they're junk. I'm like, yeah, that was a bad idea. <laughs> if you'd have bought real walk-behind tractors, they'd still be running. Yeah, there's some other uh, examples of European equipment. Real specialized rice equipment here. Again, big belts, no guards. Nice big flywheel, though. I think that's a lot of torque. This is a, uh, this, this is a serious expression on this guy's face. just cracks me up. Um, this is a, a knockoff of the Yanmar diesel. Ever, anybody know the brand, the brand name Yanmar? It's a Japanese uh, diesel engine company. It's been around for years. So that, that brand name of the Chinese knockoff is Ramne, which is Yanmar backwards. They have no shame. So, yes, this is my neighbor's high tunnel. We developed the plastic mulch layer for the walk behind tractor about 20 years ago because a lot of people want to do the plastic culture. I'm not a big fan of plastic culture myself, but it, it works and it you know, saves a lot of weeding and things like that. And there are apparently some biodegradable plastics now, although. Does anybody know if those biodegradable? I know that for a while they were organic certified, and then they weren't organic certified, or they aren't. Okay, so poo on them. Um, but there's paper mulch, and I think that is can be certified organic. Uh, and we, pardon? Don't use it on a raised bed. Got to lay it flat. The paper mulch? Yeah, because right at the bend. Mm. Yep, I hadn't thought about that. Flex would probably do that, wouldn't it? Because we redesigned our mulch layer last year so that it could accept paper, too. Um, but I hadn't thought about that on the raised bed. That's a good point. I shall remember. Thank you, Eric. You're hired. <laughs> yep, we developed a crimper roller because we thought they were so cool. We had to make a baby version for the walking tractor. Uh, of course, we worked with the Rodale, uh, you know, the Rodale people out of Pennsylvania because they had come up with that idea in the first place. Flail mowers for cover crop management. And just grind it up. Very popular flail mowers. Only they weren't back ordered nine months now. Lots of tillage options. Rotary plow is uh, something that is was actually pioneered by Gravely. Another pioneered thing. Uh, or at least pioneered on a walk behind tractor, but that is a, a quite a concept. I mean, the rotary plow allows something like a walk behind tractor, which is a relatively light, low power machine, to do an amazing job at primary tillage. You know, you can take this thing with a rotary plow, you can take a, a 10 or 11 horsepower walking tractor out in this lawn or out in some field that hasn't been worked in 50 years, and you can plow a foot deep in the first pass. It's just amazing. And it leaves the ground in one pass looking like you plowed and disked it, more or less. 
not as fine as rototillering or power harrowing, but broken up pretty darn well for a one-pass deal. But it's using, it's, it's like, an, it's an auger, as you can see. It's a, it's a spiral. So it's digging in. The PTO power is screwing itself into the ground as the tractor moves it forward. So it just discharges the soil to the one side as it's going along, which is why they class it as a plow, because it's leaving a furrow where it's actually worked and discharging the soil off to one side, just kind of like a moldboard does. The big difference being, A, you're not using tons of traction to pull it because it's screwing itself through the ground, essentially. And B, it's breaking up the soil a lot more than just a moldboard, which just flops it over. And the power harrow is kind of came, come to prominence as the ultimate and secondary to, uh, cultivation because it, that's what's on this machine here. The power harrow has vertical tines that turn this way. Okay? So think egg beater instead of a rototiller, which turns this way. So the power harrow and the rotary plow, both being that they are vertical axis, there is no descending of the blades through the soil, which causes a smearing and hard pan action at the bottom of the tilt. Those blades are working at a constant depth in the soil going forward, so you don't have that compression. No, no, no measurable hard pan using either of those tools, uh, as, as told to me by a guy who bought one from me and told me later his job was a Kentucky, the Kentucky State Ecologist. So he had these, like, professional grade penetrometers he could take home and use his garden. <laughs> He's like, yep, no problem. And we have conventional tillers as well, of course, which still have their place. And then mechanic, man, you know, manual cultivation tools. That's the power harrow turned up on its side so you can see the vertical tines. And power harrows are available for full-size tractors as well. I mean, I've seen them 12 feet wide. Uh, you don't see as many power harrows in the U.S. on full-size farming equipment as you do in Europe. Uh, we're just a little behind, but they're becoming more popular. And there's that. Uh, the rotary plow, interestingly, is something you just don't see on full-size tractors. They just haven't been scaled up there at all. It's just a walk-behind tractor tool. And, and because of the side discharge that a rotary plow has, the way it spits the soil out to the side, a lot of people have exploited that as a bed-making tool. You can just make awesome raised beds with the things, or any kind, of, any kind of work that requires shifting the soil. Hilling potatoes, hilling corn, making a drainage ditch, um, you know, covering the edge of landscape fabric or, or plastic mulch if you didn't want to spring for the mulch layer. There's a rotary plow. Yes. The power can you adjust the depth or just Oh, no, no, no. That, that big mesh roller on the back... This mesh roller, which you can see here, there's a screw crank right there that cranks it up and down. So it is utterly precise. I mean, that screw crank, I'll just drag this around here. Are you looking for it like Yes, I am. Because it's that kind of, it's that kind of conference. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, just wherever you want it. See, it locks in position every half revolution. That's about one-eighth inch increments in depth. So you can totally get this thing wherever you want it. And when you want to transport it, of course, you just crank it up yeah. off the ground so the tines don't scratch. So zero to five inches depth, or five and a half. And for oh, yes, very much. Yep. And we even, the, the roller system on the power harrows was so popular that a roller was developed for the back of the tiller as well, for people who wanted that sort of precise depth control with the tiller. And there's two things that the roller does for you. One is obviously precise depth control. The other is just pressing the bed, making it perfectly flat and perfectly, and kind of firming it up, pressing a little of the air out of it. Um, because if you're, if you're a market farmer and you're investing in precision multi-row seeding equipment, you know, that lays down four rows of lettuce at once, rototilled soil is too fluffy. Those things will just get bogged down in that. You need a firm bed. So this, you know, a lot of people for years were rototilling and then running a roller over the bed just to press it down uh, and then running their seeder. So this saves an operation because you've pressed the bed at the same time. So... Yeah, that was a nice addition. They just came out with a compost spreader. Uh, that's actually made in Pennsylvania, just adapted to a walk-behind tractor. It's a, a ground drive thing. There's no PTO shaft. It just runs a little conveyor belt and drops the compost out the front. 
don't confuse it with a manure spreader, though. People have tried to put manure through those things, and you, something that clumpy is not going to go through it. It has to be pretty well done compost. So, oh yeah, this is an optional roller style that you can put on both the power harrow or the roller behind the tiller. It's a bar style roller. I don't know if the light allows you to see that, but this is a series of bars and with openings in between. So it's like a um, like a cage almost. But that leaves the soil more fluffy because it's not pressing it's not pressing it down as as smooth. So you've got more fluff, essentially, you've only got about 25% of your surface area of, of the rollers touching the ground. So if you're doing weed control, see, this leaves your weeds more exposed. If you're pressing them all back in with a flat or even the mesh roller, you're going to have more regermination of the weeds, especially if you get a little rain. This leaves it more fluffy where there, there's more of a chance of the weeds dying. Vacuum seeders, something we started bringing in from Italy a few years ago. Um, for the ultimate in seed singulation. I mean, there's the Jang seeders, which a lot of you in the market gardening world may be familiar with. These are Korean-made and very nice units. Um, you know, usually you see the, the single-row push-type Jang seeders, which are great. Um, probably the best bang for the buck in terms of precision of seeders uh, uh, for small seeds. Now, if you're planting corn and beans, these things aren't too effective. Then the Haas seeders, we had actually, uh, the Haas equipment is made in Georgia. They make wheel hose, and they started developing these seeders, which they sell as a, just a full-on standalone seeder unit. We looked at it and said, well, we can take the handlebars off, take the front wheel off, we can put it on a walk-behind tractor. So we started rigging up these things. And then last, well, two years ago, because of COVID and the gardening craze that went across the country, Haas couldn't keep up with orders, like most gardening companies. And they said, we're discontinuing dealer sales, so we can no longer buy that cedar. <laughs> I'll have to take the slide out one of these days. But you can still buy the cedars from Haas, and we've got the rigging hardware to adapt them to a walk-behind tractor. That's a more affordable cedar. It's a little better with big seeds. It's not as precise as the Jang for small seeds. Um, this solves all the issues. It'll plant anything from lettuce to lima beans, and it'll do it 100% accurately. The problem is that rig right there is $4,000 without the tractor. <laughs> I mean, vacuum seeders are not cheap. So you have to have the right size operation to really justify the, the cost of those things. Reciprocating spader. Everybody know what a spader is in here? I see some nods. So for people who don't know a spader, a spader is a machine that mechanically does what you would do with a shovel. It has spades that kind of, as the tractor goes along, they go into the ground at a 45 degree angle and sort of kick the soil up. So spaders have been popularized mostly on full-size tractors, and they're a great way, it's one of the best ways to work soil that does not cause a hard pan, does not invert the soil structure, um, doesn't break it up too fine, doesn't over-pulverize the soil. The problem with spaders is they're relatively violent because of that action, this reciprocating action. Think of a jackhammer with four heads, essentially. It's not quite that bad, but it's, it's rough. And, you know, when you have it behind a full-size tractor and you have three-point hitch linkage kind of insulating you from the machine, it allows the machine to, you know, jump a little bit behind you and you don't feel it as much. A walk-behind tractor, it's solid bolted to the machine and you feel it and you don't want to run one very long. So we don't sell many of them, but uh, you know, some for high tunnel use and things like that, because you know, you can take this thing right in a three foot walk door. I mean, it's great. Most of the equipment is sized around the you know, 26 to 34 inch width, and so you can get in some small spaces. Yeah, we have to delete this. I gotta work on this presentation. Because the diesel is not available in North America anymore, unfortunately. The EPA has done away with the small diesels. Just not clean burning enough, which I think is a crock because they use a lot less fuel. It's hard to believe they're actually polluting more, but I think what they look at is the amount of pollution put into the atmosphere per gallon burned rather than per horsepower produced over a certain period of time. If they looked at that, they have more diesels on the, on the market. These small diesels are super efficient. Maintenance costs. Yeah. See, without complicated hydraulic or electrical systems, now we've got a hydraulic system. 
But most of the log burning reactors don't have a hydraulic system, so they will be simpler to, to maintain. This one's going to be a little more complicated, this particular one here. As I say, you know, this is the first, you know, introduced two years ago, this is the first walk mount tractor with a hydro component, most of them. Um, it's amazing what we've walked people through on the phone, you know, when the customer's in Idaho or Northern California or, you know, 300 miles from their nearest dealer and they need to do something, and we're like, yeah, you can do this. Here's a video. And they do it. Yeah, it's nice to be able to empower people. Yeah, not, not much soil compaction happens when your tractor weighs three or 400 pounds. Um, yeah, I've, I've done that. I don't have the Civic Wagon anymore, though. Uh, but that was, I, I remember going to that trade show. It was in Wolf County, Kentucky, and I dragged this, all this stuff out of my Honda Civic Wagon, and this, these old-timers were just standing there watching me, and they're like, that all came out of there? <laughs> Can you like, believe it? Because we bought the kickouts just to get the wheels out of our production zone. Yeah. The, the axle extensions for the tractor. Yeah. Yeah, because I was concerned about the compaction. Yeah. But what do you mean by virtually with it in my bed? Well, I mean, compared to a four wheel tractor. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of. You know, there's a decent amount of people who want to straddle the bed. Right, so they get zero compaction in the beds. But, I mean, there's thought going both ways on that, really. I don't bother trying to straddle the beds. Now, some of it is depending on your soil type, um, you know, how compactable it is, and how, you know, and how good a shape it's in. Um, but, but what I found from in my own experience is that, you know, what little compaction the wheels cause going through the bed the soil working equipment is coming along behind that and essentially erasing it, right? So if I'm running a tiller or a power hair or whatever behind the tractor, it's, you know, what little compression those wheels are causing is just erased. It just fluffs the soil right back up again. Uh, it's not doing that deep level of compaction you would get with a machine that weighed two tons rolling across the soil where just fluffing up the top is not really going to help. So... Now, there's some tasks you would be doing on a bed where you, you need to straddle. For example, if you're running a multi-row seeder, you don't want to have tire tracks on top of the bed because the implement is not going to erase those tracks and you don't want to plant into a tire track. Same with the plastic mulch layer or the bed shaper or anything like that where the implement is not going to erase the tracks. Then straddling is kind of a must. And there's also situations we've encountered where the soil is so soft, uh, silty or sandy soils, and especially when people are doing raised beds, where if they put the tractor wheels up on the bed, they might not have a compaction issue, but the problem is the bed is not firm enough. It will crumble away. You know, as the tires pass across the top of the bed, the sides of the bed just crumble away. Clay, which is what we've got around here, is awful stuff, but it's very stackable. <laughs> it has a lot of structure to it. You can bake a raised bed, you know, eight inches high, and run your wheels right at the edge, and it just stays there. It doesn't crumble down. Um, so, yeah, it's a great building material. Um, it's unfortunate we have to grow in it too, but you know, such is life. Yeah, the average European is not as heavy as the average American, let me tell you. I've been to Italy many times, and they're not afraid to walk, and that's a big reason for it. I mean, there's so many farmers, you know, that I've talked to, oh, I wouldn't use that, I'd have to walk. I'm like, dude. But your doctor tells you to go to a health club and walk for 20 minutes a day? I mean, it just cracks me up, the people who will, you know, ride their lawnmower to mow their half acre and then go to a health club and walk on a treadmill. Duh. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We are actually working on a front loader prototype. I said we couldn't do it, but we're, we're, we're working on it. It has its own set of wheels, so it sort of makes it into a four-wheel conveyance so you don't lift yourself up in the air. We actually found a company in Italy that makes a backhoe attachment for these things. Not terribly practical. We brought one in and fooled around with it, and, you know, you'd get it down in there and hook it under one of these nice big rocks we have in Kentucky and lift the whole machine up, and we're like, no, I don't think so. This is for, like, Florida. So... Yeah, tractive, tractive power is always a challenge when your machine weighs three or 400 pounds. People say, well, I want to pull this log out of the woods. I'm like, well, <laughs> your log weighs three times what the tractor does. You're just not going to do it. 
you know, and uh, yeah, there's, there's just real limits to physics. <laughs> there's nothing you can do about that. Yes, it's a very capable machine, and I have pulled some logs out of the woods that were pretty big, uh, but you know, there's a there's a very real limit, a, a stop point, as to what you can move with a walk behind tractor, even though it seems invincible. Yeah, we're working on that too. A little espresso machine. No, that's not lunch. What am I thinking? So, and then we have the people who get so into walk behind tractors that they think they're going to do everything with them. I had this guy on the phone one time, and he's like, he wanted to work 50 acres, literally, with, with walk behind tractors. And I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> Unless you have nothing but time, and you don't feel like sleeping, you're not going to do this. Or you buy a fleet of them and hire a bunch of people to run them. You know, you're, you're, you're working 30 inches at a time with this thing, or with a sickle bar, you may be cutting five feet at a time. But still, it's not a, you know, 10-foot mower. So there's a limit to what you can comfortably do. I remember one guy who was really adamant about, this is the right equipment for me. He wanted to bale hay. You know, he had a small hay lot and animals to feed, and he was in Alaska. And he was going to cut 26 acres with a walk behind tractor, which is a stretch anywhere. I mean, I typically wouldn't do over 15 with a walk behind tractor in terms of hay production. But this guy was going to do 26. And he used the season and he sold it because his hay season was like this long because the window for doing everything in Alaska is really compressed. And he's like, I just can't get it on the ground fast enough. I'm like, dude, I told you. So we put it on our bulletin board on our website and we helped him sell it. I'm like, now, next time I won't sell to that guy, no matter what he thinks. Yeah, but even, even on a lot of larger, you know, we've sold plenty of these things to, you know, farmers who have big acreages and they have big tractors, but there's places they can't go, mowing ditches and doing the small work and beds and things like this. So there's a lot of places where walking on tractors can be practical, even on very large farms and properties. Here's the little baler. That's in our little hay field out back. Yeah. Yeah, I've displayed at some big agriculture conferences, and they, you know, these big farmers walk by. Well, that's about bite size for a cow. <laughs> but you can pick that up. And, I, and I'm like, it's the same size as square bale. Why do you give me all this crap? It's just because it's round. And your, your round bale is this tall, you know, and you need a bale steer to pick yours up. But it's the same amount of hay that goes in a square bale. So nobody scoffs at square bales. <laughs> uh, so anyway, it's weird. How are we for time, anyway? Okay. Well, I can, I can drag this out. <laughs> Just tell a few jokes. No, we won't go there. Oh, yeah, see? <laughs> Damn! <laughs> Man, it's been a while since I gave this time. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Yeah. We, uh, we actually build the generators at our place. We we're like, well, we've got a PTO. We might as well use it to do something. So we buy the generator from one company, and we have a local fabrication place make up the frame, and... That's belts. We, we use belts to drive the generator because we needed a cheap way to step the power up, and it was a lot cheaper than making a gearbox. And since it's a constant load like that, you're not running, you're not losing all the power through the belts. Uh, hydraulic log splitter, of course, that was a kind of a no-brainer. These are fun because, you know, the, most of the tractor models have a road gear in them, which will go nine, well, eight to ten miles an hour depending on the model. So you can really zip around. Uh, I always love demonstrating tractors to people at the shop, and I slap it in that gear and just burn out, you know, and bob the drop open. Do they read the specs, but they don't really know what it means. Nine miles an hour? Hmm, it seems fast. Yeah, you run, or you ride. We actually worked with one of our Italian vendors to come up with a stump grinder. Again, the stump grinders in Europe, they're like, why would you cut a tree? <laughs> like, yeah, in America, this gets done a lot. So they developed the thing. Works great. There's some more things. Snow removal in the Alps is a big deal. And of course in the north. But around here we don't, have, we don't think too much about snow removal, especially with the way the climate's going these days. But uh, plenty of places still, 
still use that a lot. And uh, the, the, the Italians made snowblowers are just amazing. I mean, you can see the, the loft of that thing. I mean, they will, they will throw snow 30 or 40 feet. The high-speed augers in these things are just tremendous. Drop seeders, that's, that was really developed more for lawn use, but uh, it works great for cover crops as well. Of course, chipper shredders. We have various types of chipper shredders, like five different models we carry, depending on what you're doing and how big a stuff you want to run through it. But that's always a popular thing for you know any kind of material reduction for composting or mulch or whatever. And this is this is actually not a pizza, even though there is a Pasquale's pizza. Uh, but Pasquale is actually a brand owned by BCS now. BCS has become like the General Motors of Walk Behind Tractors. They bought two of their competitors in the 90s, uh, Pasquale and Ferrari, which were other Italian companies. And no, Ferrari is not the automotive Ferrari, even though they do go 99 miles, no, nine miles an hour. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's actually a, kind of a sore spot with me because in the past few years, BCS started painting their whole transmission black. The only thing that's blue on this machine anymore, which is the historic color of BCS, is the plastic. Everything else on this machine is black or silver. And they did that because the same production line is now producing Pasquale, Ferrari, and BCS. So they get, you know, they go through one paint booth. It's black. They get to the end of the assembly line, they put a green shroud on this one, a yellow shroud on that one, and a blue shroud on this one, and they've made three different brands of tractors, just like General Motors.